Step 2. Integration with classical systems. Rod, the title of this step says integration with classical systems. Does that mean that the quantum internet is not going to replace the classical internet? That's a good question, but yes, the, the, the quantum internet will not replace the classical internet. There will be two networks. Right. So how are they going to talk to each other? How are they going to integrate together? Well, let's see. So on this diagram here, we've got what says quantum network and an IP network. Um, what's the quantum network do? Well, we've seen that in a number of lessons here. Uh -huh. The main purpose is to distribute entanglement between parties, whether it be bipartite entanglement, multipartite entanglement, so that it can be used as a resource for communication tasks, such as teleportation uh, and QKD, whether it's entanglement-based or single photon-based. And QKD is, in fact, the example that's written here on, on, the, uh, on the diagram. So the QKD devices, what are they doing across, across the quantum network? Remind us, what's, what's the service they provide? Well, the thing that they're trying to do is they're trying to establish a secret correlated key between one communicating party and the other one without any eavesdropper knowing what the key is. Right. So what's a key in this, in this context? A key is... So key is a secret, secret uh, a bit of strings, classical bit of strings that we can use to hide our message. All right. So it's a string of random bits that are guaranteed to be secret based on, on, yeah. on what we've done so far. So what we want to do once we've got those is to use them. Ah, they are classical bits. Yes, they're classical bits. Did I say yes. No, 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 no. no. Okay, good. Yes, that's so. why we can uh, use them with the classical internet. Yes. So that, in fact, that's what we're going to do next is we're going to actually use them with, with the classical internet. So the first job that happens is the quantum network makes the, those keys and it makes those classical uh, bits out of it. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to share those bits with a couple of boxes that are connected to an IP network that are called IPsec gateways, and there, there will be one of those at each end. Um, mm -hmm. Have you heard of IPsec? Not really, no. Okay, so IPsec is one of the standard internet protocols for how you encrypt data that you're going to share across, across the network. One of the other famous protocols is a protocol that's called TLS, which is used mm -hmm. for web browsing and for a lot of other things. Um, IPsec is actually slightly older than TLS, and it, its original design was to connect one network to another network securely. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, uh, you send data to your, to your nearby IPsec gateway, and it encrypts the data and sends it to uh, another IPsec gateway at the other end, where it gets decrypted and sent to your partner over there. Mm -hmm. So it's a standard protocol for doing that. Now, so once we've got the keys to the IPsec gateways, um, before QKD, the way that these IPsec gateways work together is they have to negotiate a, uh, a key exchange of some sort. So we talked in the encryption lesson about three phases of an encrypted conversation, right? Mm -hmm. There was a authentication, key generation, and then the bulk data encryption, yep. right? So the, uh, the authentication is often done using public key. The key generation mm -hmm. prior to QKD was primarily done using a mechanism called Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what we're going to replace mm -hmm. with the QKD. And then that data will be used to actually, the, that key that comes out of the QKD network um, or the quantum internet and the QKD devices attached to it will be used to create the keys that are used by the IPsec gateways for encrypting large amounts of data, which gets sent using um, an encryption mechanism. Well, most commonly these days, an encryption mechanism called AES, the Advanced mm -hmm. Encryption Standard. So that's, mm -hmm. so right. you get this encrypted connection. Um, and uh, it's important to note here that, that the QKD connection itself actually requires that you also have an authenticated classical channel between the nodes in order to prevent someone standing in the middle of the network and mm -hmm. pretending to be Alice in one direction and pretending to be Bob in the other direction. And that's what's called a man in the middle attack. Mm -hmm. And we want to try to get rid of, try to avoid having that happen. I see. So let me get this straight. The role of the quantum network really is just one step in the whole number of steps uh, during uh, a secret communication. Exactly. So we start classically, we authenticate classically, 
But then when we require the generation of the key, that's where the quantum part comes in. That's where the quantum magic happens, either through non-fully uh, non distinguishable states, such, such as we saw in the BB84 protocol, or entanglement-based quantum key distribution using the E91 protocol. Right. And whatever the result that, of that is, it should be a secret correlated key that's not known to any other malicious party, which then gets passed back into the classical network and we proceed classically again. Exactly. Good. And so all of this put together makes for an integrated quantum and classical system. So you're the expert on a couple of these other things that we might want to do, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We've, we've uh, talked about uh, distributed quantum computation where uh, Alice, Bob, Eve, Dave, and Charlie, they share some quantum resources but individually they cannot perform the computation that they want to. They don't have enough quantum power. So they have to figure out how to share this quantum power with each other and to create something that allows them then to uh, tackle much uh, larger quantum problems. So for that, again, they have to share some quantum resources that's done by the quantum network. But then they have to coordinate with classical messages using the classical network what they need to perform. They need to they basically use the classical control of the classical provided by the classical network to then perform the quantum computation on the quantum part of their memories, their processors, and so on. So in that in that case, this network of quantum computers that's going to do this distributed computation mm. is that distributed computation is that a complete application? Is that like quantum Photoshop or, or, or quantum Oracle database or some, something? Or... Well, I would say never say never, but for, <laughs> me, but for now, the, the, the problems that we envision tackling with quantum stuff are things that are genuinely quantum, where classical, problem, uh, classical computers can help, but are too slow. For example, um, diagonalizing large matrices, uh, finding new properties of uh, new drugs, new materials, uh, and so on. Um, I don't think that there will be an application of a quantum Photoshop where we can, <laughs> where we can, I, I don't even know how that would work in reality. I don't either. So the, the chemistry one's a really good example yeah. because, because there, there, as I understand it, there will be some classical pre-processing and then mm. we'll do a quantum step and then mm -hmm. after you get back your quantum answers mm -hmm. then there's going to be some more classical computing to, to mm -hmm. do. Is that mm -hmm. right? That's true. That's true. That's okay. known as the VQE uh, or the variation quantum eigensolver where really again the, the quantum part in the entire computation is just one tiny step in a series of steps. But it's a very important one that's particularly slow using only classical computation and classical devices. Okay. And so all of that will fit together into a distributed and integrated quantum and classical That's right. system, the information system that other people will then use. That's right. Okay, what's the other one? Well, the other one is our uh, clock synchronization, where we mentioned that uh, having a global time standard where everybody agrees on the same time is of crucial importance in many, many areas of our modern life. And again, it's not that we want to do something special with quantum time, <laughs> the time is classical, but the way on how we agree on the same global standard of time comes through using quantum resources, such as entanglement, such as bipartite entanglement, and so on. Okay, so, and then once you've got that, then it gets used in... It, goes by, it gets bumped back into the classical network, and it's very important for transportation, for GPS, so global positioning system, financial market, where even fractions of a second are crucial. Uh, they can either gain you millions or you can lose millions, <laughs> and, and so on and so forth. So time, okay. time is very important, and keeping, keeping uh, the same time as somebody on the other side of the world is very, very important as well. All right, so all of this will fit together. So there's going to be a quantum network and there's going to be some IP network, you know, the existing classical internet or what have you. And these two things are going to have to come together in order to build these complete integrated hybrid quantum classical distributed systems. <laughs> Synchronized. Synchronized. So, Synchronized. Yes, that's an important point too. <laughs> okay, so let's see in the next step how we can bring these things together. Ooh. All right, so with standardization, right, the first thing you're going to do, of course, is you're going to actually build and test some sort of system. You've got a prototype that's up and running, right? Mm. 
Um, and then what? Well, then once that is working, we would like everybody else to use it. Yeah, and in communications, one of the things that means is that it's really nice if my communications device will talk to your communications yes. device. Yes, even though I was the one who made my device and you were the one who created your device, maybe using completely different means. So how do we standardize these things? Well, there are a lot of meetings and things that go on in making all this happen. Um, but in particular, for a, a concrete example, we might have to worry about the physical layer and the protocol layer. Mm -hmm. And those might actually be standardized by different organizations that are actually involved in this. So at the physical layer, so I know how you might do that with like, you know, electrical signals for the Ethernet or, or something. Mm -hmm. And um, the organizations will define voltage levels and how long signals are allowed for. And um, one of the things you talked about earlier was distortion of mm -hmm. signals due to modal dispersion. Mm -hmm. You were talking about that in terms of optical fibers, right? Mm -hmm. But that same kind of phenomenon happens with any kind of signal. And so one of the things you have to worry about is how much of that is allowed so that you can still guarantee that the end nodes will be able to reconstruct things. Mm -hmm. um, so all that's for, for classical signals. What are sort of the equivalents of that for photons? Well, we said that uh, in quantum communication, we're interested in exchanging information via single photons. So we have to think about how do we get two different devices to talk, particularly at the, at the, at the border of two networks. So they will have to exchange photons. So how can we ensure that whatever photons I provide to the other network, it gets accepted, recognized, and vice versa? Mm. So I imagine things that will be important will be the wavelength of the photons, uh, will be the w shape of the wave packet of the photons, and basically ensuring that if we are trying to establish an entangled uh, link between two networks, we saw that that happens with the BSA, right? Mm -hmm. And we mentioned, we stressed that the two photons that are coming in, in order for them to interfere, they must be indistinguishable. So somehow we must have a procedure and a standard procedure that makes sure that whatever photons you are sending me are the same photons as I'm sending to you, and then they can hit each other, interfere at the BSA, and create entanglement between us and okay. between the two networks that we are part of. Sounds good to me. So the kinds of organizations that do that are organizations that are like um, the IETF and the IEEE and ANSI and, and organizations like that. Mm -hmm. um, they'll be involved in all of this at some point too.